Um, I've been nutrition coaching now for two years almost. Um, I was nutrition coaching with Lisa about three and a half, three years ago. Um, years. Wow, it's, it's a while. It's crazy. Yes. Went through a whole pandemic. <laughs> I <didn't do> that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, I did nutrition coaching um, with Lisa. That was like a great experience. And um, you obviously taught me a lot. Um, and then I did a lot of research on my own, um, did a couple certificates. Um, I've done precision nutrition, Girls Gone Strong, um, and Sam Miller's uh, Functional Nutrition and Metabolic School. Um, so those are a couple certificates that I've got. And so I've been nutrition coaching now for the past two, two years. Um, another part of what like really wanted, led me to wanting to do nutrition coaching was that um, I work as a registered nurse. So I work as a registered nurse, um, primarily on labor and delivery. I've also worked on acute inpatient psychiatry. Um, so that has been um, kind of like my home base. And so a lot of my um, nutritional knowledge and teaching I do with clients is, I do kind of tend to attract um, females like trying to get pregnant and looking at like nutrition and pregnancy and nutrition and postpartum and just some of the finer details as to how we can optimize um, nutrition for those um, goals and also um, because of working on like psychiatry it's really really interesting like working there um, how much nutrition um, ties into and like nutrition exercise movement ties into um, our mental health um, and so that was really really interesting to see and like talking to the dietitians there and looking at like different blood work markers and how those can improve with like the right nutritional um, um, choices and so like it's all been really really interesting to see how um, those two careers kind of blend together. And I find that from working as a registered nurse, um, while I do love medicine, I'm like devoted to medicine, I do think that there is another side um, and approaching like that through the nutrition coaching side and kind of talking mm -hmm. to clients from a holistic lens is something I very much enjoy as well. That's awesome. Thank you for giving us a bit of an intro. And I already so many questions kind of popped up for me because I, I love that you have obviously always been interested in health. And um, I think from the nutritional perspective, you're probably coming at people more from a prevention side, yeah. whereas I could imagine in your registered work, mm -hmm. uh, nurse work, you treat people more in their mm -hmm. like, symptoms already yeah well um, totally like working even on labor and delivery people might think like nutrition like it's not as important on labor and delivery as compared to like on a medicine unit or like working with maybe like an older population or more of like an actual like uh, population experiencing illness but when we look at people like in pregnancy like there is a lot of things that you can do to either optimize or potentially like make your pregnancy harder and make your childbirth more mm -hmm. difficult like for example, like looking at like gestational diabetes, like there is a large component of that that is diet related and making sure like the, like the understanding is there. And sometimes I find like, if only like some teaching had been done prior to, then maybe there would have been a bit more of a deeper understanding and a bit more empowerment for those patients rather than yeah. feeling so confused and overwhelmed and like unsure and that's stressful for them. So I think as much as we can teach and educate earlier on, then even if somebody does get a diagnosis like that, they feel empowered to deal and like work through that diagnosis rather than at the mercy of like the medical system and feeling like help me <laughs> this is absolutely. overwhelming absolutely i do think a large component comes back to education for sure um but often also there's just so much misleading information out there so it is difficult for people but i love how you're tying the two things together somehow and how you're seeing maybe similarities um, or connections rather in each one of your professions. Um, so I'm curious if you think that there are certain things that both your, your patients in the hospital and um, your clients um, are, I don't wanna say are lacking, but if they attack that, they potentially wouldn't have the current issues that they're having. So like whether that be activity wise or nutritional. I would even just say like bringing it down to a more basic level, like understanding how to build, build a meal, like truly mm -hmm. understanding like all the components of a meal and building meals that are not like spiking blood sugar and not like just like creating like hunger and cravings and like prompting that more so because they're not, eating balanced meals. So mm -hmm. I think like, even like when we work with our clients, we start everyone off with like a healthy habits plan. And that's looking at the foundational things of just like building meals, because like that can change so much without diving into like 
even tracking and like we all love tracking and I think it's such a beneficial educational tool but just understanding like visually what a plate mm -hmm. should look like it's just it's it's not the standard and like I'm sure you've talked to clients about this but a lot of my clients they struggle sometimes when they go out to like different family events or like out to eat because like it's not the North American way <laughs> um, to have like a protein and a veggie and to have those be like the main portions of the dish rather than the carbs and the fats so absolutely it's really yeah I think if anything like just understand I'm like okay a plate should look like this eat until satiety not over full mm -hmm. like I think that would go a long way and then as far as movement goes walking mm -hmm. like if more people could just go for walks like it's it's low entry like it's easy there's a low barrier like it's it's one of the best things people can do for again blood sugar balance overall health metabolism so if i, I love that really... you say that because a lot of people think it needs to be so much more complicated but especially mm -hmm. in terms of prevention and there are so many benefits to just the basics really yeah. and mm -hmm. um i think with um, you know, assembling the pl plates, as you said, like protein, carb, and healthy fat sort of thing, or vegetables, obviously, in there, too. And walking with those two things paired, eating until satiated, not until full. People could achieve so much already, like, just with those basics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, agree. I think sometimes in, like, the nutritional space, we like to get into the nitty-gritty. And, like, for example, like, um, my co-coach, her husband owns a CrossFit gym. So we do do a lot of, like, like high level athletes and mm -hmm. like looking at like nutrition timing and like all those things but for the general population like it's so funny like people come and they're like so jazzed about supplements and I'm like yeah but you're walking 3,000 steps so yeah. <laughs> let's like actually tackle what matters and like explaining to them like what's going to be your biggest mover and like what's the low hanging fruit here and what can we actually do that's sustainable I think that's like the piece that's missing from like a lot of like nutritional programs is that sustainability piece and that like preference like what do you actually enjoy um, because that does matter <laughs> um, and I think that's like the beauty of nutrition coaching right is you get to talk to clients get to know them and see like okay you actually enjoy this like let's lean into that and then maybe this thing that's not going to be our biggest mover and let's kind of leave that for now and see if there's a time and a place for that in the future Awesome. No, I, I like that you say that because adherence is key, obviously. And most of the time, we're only going to adhere if we enjoy what we're doing. As well. So I mm -hmm. uh, really like that. Um, and I'm super curious about you saying you work with a lot of people that want to get pregnant or mm -hmm. also postpartum. Um, in terms of nutrition, what are some of the main things that you initially do with them to, I guess, get a um, a regular period again so for example if someone comes to you and they have a missing period or so do you have any pointers for them mm -hmm. yeah and this is where like I really do um, enjoy tracking um, because it, it gives us control right and like we're big believers in like what you like measures what you can manage mm -hmm. um, and a lot of clients who for example have like an irregular period um, like I have quite a few clients who've been diagnosed with like hypothalamic or diagnosed mm -hmm. with uh, PCOS um, and then we look through blood work together and then we kind of talk about like, okay, this is what we're seeing. Like, how can we optimize some of these things? And it depends where they're coming from too. Like, for example, if they're just coming off a of hormonal birth control, let's look at some like vitamins that maybe were depleted because of that. And then there is a place for supplementation there through like choosing specific foods and also potentially like actual supplements. Um, but the biggest thing is making sure that they're eating enough calories, mm. um, to, to, like maintenance calories to support that because um, depending on where the person is. So for example, if somebody's diagnosed with PCOS um, and there is like blood sugar dysregulation happening um, and they are like in a position where fat loss might be beneficial for them, then we talk about that and we put that in the perspective of a timeline um, because there is a lot of research that shows losing 5 to 10% of your body weight can be beneficial for some people with PCOS to help restore regular ovulation. So then that is something that we would potentially tackle depending on what the client wants and what they um, prefer and what their timelines are um, but then again just looking at making sure so once after a fat loss phase say for an example with a client with PCOS who is in a position where that would be beneficial we would do that get them up to maintenance um, and then during that time really focusing on food quality um, mm -hmm. and like whole food meals eating at regular hours um, I typically don't recommend like intermittent fasting for somebody who's trying to conceive like we do want like that energy available to them and sending that signal to their body 
Um, and then just protein, making sure that they're eating adequate protein because that's truly the building blocks for our body and for baby too, um, when they do conceive. Um, and then for hypothenomic and menorrhea, um, it kind of depends where they're coming from. If it's more of like a under eating, like, and then like if their exercise is truly like over exercise or just maybe just actually just under eating for their current exercise levels. So again, talking through um, that with them, getting them up to eating maintenance calories and then teaching them about their cycles. This is like one of the things that I think is just so overlooked, even as a labor and delivery nurse, like there is not enough education because for example, like even like personally, like I don't ovulate until day 24 and that's my normal and that's, that's me. And like, it's like that historical, like you ovulate on day 14 and therefore your period should come on this day and it's not. And so I've had so many women coming to me, like who have been diagnosed with infertility, when in reality, they're just mistiming. And so talking to them about that too, and like obviously supporting it from like a nutritional standpoint, but just as like a broader holistic focus, looking at like, okay, what's like, what's your lifestyle like? What's your sleep like? What's your stress like? Do we understand like how to time intercourse based on your goal? Like, and then talking about those things. Um, and then of course, like limiting things that like could potentially be interfering um, with conceiving or that we know can be damaging, such as like excessive alcohol, smoking, um, mm -hmm like poor activity levels or um, too much caffeine. We talk about all those things and just kind of look at the person and see like what their goals are. And then again, what their non-negotiables are. Because I've had some clients be like, I'm not giving up my two cups of coffee. And then it's like, okay, yeah. let's optimize everything else. So yeah, <laughs> yeah um, those are kind of like the biggest things. And it's like with pregnancy, it's such like a case by case. And like, it's a lot of history and then a lot of emotional work too. Um, because there is a lot, like if somebody's trying to conceive and if they've been trying to conceive for an extended period of time, um, sometimes that can feel like work. Um, mm -hmm. And so just like being that person in their corner to cheer them on, I find has been really, really beneficial for them just to have somebody to lean on, um, as well as like tackling, like, yeah, looking at like different parts of their menstrual cycle and maybe supporting um, different things during different times can be beneficial. Oh, I love, I love all of that because especially in terms of like the length of your cycle for example mm -hmm. i think it's just giving you permission to be more individual you know sometimes we think what's wrong with me i'm not fitting into this exact box mm -hmm. or what's wrong with me this doesn't apply to me but mm -hmm. just because we're out of the norm doesn't yeah. mean that there's anything wrong with us necessarily mm -hmm. well and coming from like a medical standpoint like for example, if somebody's trying to conceive, they get blood work done on day three and day 21. And day 21, they're testing for, like, did they ovulate on day 14 and is there progesterone not? But if somebody doesn't ovulate until day 22, mm. well, guess what? That blood work's not going to show anything. So I do also talk to my clients about, like, how to, like, like, look at their menstrual cycle and communicate this to their doctor and advocate for themselves, like, from that point of view. Because I do think that there needs to be a blending between, like, holistic coaching and medicine. And yes. teaching somebody to be an advocate for themselves is, like, always the end goal. Absolutely. I love that. It's really cool. And the educational piece, once again, fits in there so well. Mm -hmm. um, the other question that I was going to ask was in regards to what you mentioned more in terms of psychology and food being related. Um, mm -hmm. what, are there, what are some things that you have noticed there? For example, have you noticed any correlations um, when people are on vegetarian or vegan diets or like mm -hmm. under consuming vitamin b or iron for example yeah. and mental mm -hmm. health and those kind of things yeah no for sure and like i actually had um a client who was vegan and like trying to conceive and wasn't understanding why um and when she started with me her protein was like 30 grams per day um and yeah. so we were talking about that and she did get tested and she was deficient in vitamin b12 and so we talked about that and like how to like work with that and she ended up eventually switching to like uh, vegetarian and she did incorporate like a lot of eggs and even sometimes fish um which Ooh. really did help things um but even just like mood and like for example like I find like a lot of clients like when they're trying to conceive like there's a lot on society about like okay like this is like the healthy diet for trying to conceive and it's like veggies and like that's it and then like fats end up coming really, really low. And so mm -hmm. talking to clients about like, okay, what does a, like a plate for fertility actually look like? And noticing like the correlation between like their biofeedback. So their energy levels, their mood, their, their sleep and everything when they're eating enough um, from like enough fats, enough carbs, enough like, protein, enough everything to support their well-being, they feel better. And like if I tackling those things, 
I find a lot of the times that you're able to address a lot of those underlying deficiencies. Um, whether you test for them or not, sometimes just by doing like making sure you're covering your bases can be enough. Um, another thing is vitamin D. Um, we know like a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D, so that's a supplement I pretty much recommend to everyone as well as um, omega-3s because we just don't get enough. But those are things that I try to like omega-3s like incorporate into everyone's diet and explaining like what those are and why they're beneficial <laughs> um, and all those things because we just know that there's such like a correlation to like decreasing inflammation, which is essential for trying to conceive. So Definitely. No, um, that's awesome. And I think vitamin B definitely is overlooked many times um, I was gonna just jump back quickly because I remembered that you mentioned PCOS also and I do think that more women have PCOS than a more women than no but B also um, yeah actually a large percentage of women out there I think this isn't something like two out of five or something like that yeah, the last I saw was eight to 14 percent of women yeah. Okay. It's the last statistic I read on the amount, um, which is, it's very high. Like it is very, very high. Um, and a lot of that is like, well, it's like a lifestyle disease mm. truly. Like it is like, it's caused by like our society and like post pandemic, like the research I've read is from 2021, which means it was probably done early 2020. Um, so I'd be curious now, um, post pandemic to see if there's been because of the high stress and how that oh, affects our bodies to see if there is like a change because there is like PCOS is related to stress, some kind of underlying stress. Um, and so I'd be curious to see if now like with all the underlying stress that people have been dealing with, because I have had a lot of clients recently been diagnosed. Wow, that's um, super interesting. I did not even think about that in terms of the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And aside from what you said in terms of um, raising up minimal calories, et cetera, and healthy fats, are there any specific things or supplements that you mm -hmm. recommend mm -hmm. for people with PCOS or even I'm going to throw endometriosis in that boat also, because mm -hmm. I think they're often, you know, kind mm -hmm. of in the same thing. Yeah. So um, I like to recommend um, NAC is a big one and acetylcycline is a big one I recommend. Um, Myelinistol, depending on if there's like a blood sugar component, but it also does help support like egg development as well and mm -hmm. egg quality, which is essential. Um, CoQ10, I sometimes use for clients, just depending on if there's any other um, medications that they're on, because there is some, like, um, compatibility issues that can arise with CoQ10. Okay. Um, those are my install NAC. Um, Vitex, depending on what the person's um, LH levels are doing, because we don't, like, Vitex helps raise luteinizing hormones. So if somebody with PCOS has an L high LH to begin with, that's not the benefit there. Um, right. But then really looking at, like, sleep. So then another one is magnesium before bed to help support sleep and also to replenish um, because when we're stressed, we deplete our magnesium. Um, those are kind of my like go-to ones as far as like menstrual cycle health and like trying to get pregnant. Zinc is another one, depending, especially if somebody's on a hormonal birth control, zinc and a B100 complex are mm -hmm. usually my go-tos because that's really often depleted in people um, coming off birth control. Um, those are kind of my big ones. For PCOS, a big part of it though is like that stress management piece. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the quality. And those are two things that I find like we can tackle all the nutrition stuff, but sometimes tackling that stress and tackling that sleep is like a lifestyle overhaul. And sometimes that can bring up a lot of like, okay, how do we set boundaries? How do we like respect our space and our me time? And like, what exercise are we like, are we exercising like from a place of like self love rather than like maybe a history of like over exercising and the need to burn calories or mm. is this like okay this is joyful movement we're like yes yeah, still like pushing towards strength training and trying to do that because we know that increases insulin sensitivity but are we like also honoring our body's needs in that day and that time so it's a lot of nuance <laughs> i guess it's, it's as... such a fine line though isn't it mm. between like okay i'm gonna develop a routine and i'm listening to my body on that day because i also <laughs> think it's hard to tell for a lot of people am i just not motivated or am i actually better off taking the day off and yeah. you know resting i find that really difficult to tell sometimes especially yeah. if people are newer to exercise yeah 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 no for sure and a lot of times i tell clients like if you're not sure go go to the gym try and if you're like no like this does not feel good like i don't feel well go walk on the track for 10 minutes and go home 
That's actually a really good point because sometimes you get started and then you're like, oh, sweet, yeah, I'm in the role. Yeah, so she feels really good, but you're not going to know unless you try. So I'm like, you mm-hmm. know what, worst comes to worst, you can walk on the truck for 20 minutes and listen to a podcast. Like, yeah, that's, that's great. So why not? Rather that's- than like sitting around and 20 minutes later being like, no, that was an excuse. Now I don't have time. Yeah, and then you feel guilty for not going, perhaps, and so that's that's actually really good advice. And um, when it comes to your nutrition clients, do you regularly get them to get blood work done also, or is that more on the key issues? Mm-hmm. In Canada, like, most things are covered, um, oh, so cool. we do have that benefit um, mm-hmm. that we can just usually, and this is a big part of like our coaching is like how to talk to your doctor and how to request specific labs because in mm-hmm. Canada, you can book an appointment and say, I'm experiencing X, Y, Z. I want this blood work. And mm-hmm. if you have a valid reason, they usually will do it. Um, yeah. And so we don't, I recommend usually like, depending on what's going on, like we're specifically trying to target something every three months. Um, like if we're like really monitoring something or like a specific level of something then every three months. Um, but usually every six months for most people, um, or yearly at minimum is what we recommend. Okay. Awesome. Great. Mm -hmm. Even just for, or actually mostly just for, you know, um, checking up everything, making sure everything is in in place and sort of a form of prevention as well. Prevention. Yeah, for sure. So usually when clients um, start with us, we do ask them like, when was your latest blood work? Um, yep. If it's been longer than six months, I'm like, hey, can you just book an appointment with your family doctor and go get some blood work done? And then I kind of tell them like a sex panel and then like lipid panel and like thyroid panel, just like looking at like the basics, blood sugar balance, looking at those things. And then we have that info. And then we talk to them too about like, okay, what's normal and what's optimal? Because mm-hmm. a lot of the times they're like, oh, well, this is normal. I'm like, yeah, based on the North American standard, it's normal. But the North American standard is also overweight and obese. So do we really want to fall within normal or do we want to lean more towards optimal and what does that look like? And then we always get them to like ideally retest in six months from starting and see if there's been any improvements. And yeah, I, I, really find that, I, I, I bet I can imagine um, with the right supplements and the right nutrition mm-hmm. improvement, what, you, what differences you can truly oh, yeah. see. Oh, like blood sugar balance, cholesterol, like all those markers, like blood pressure. Like it's crazy to like, and a lot of people, like, I'm sure you know, like, a lot of people, like, numbers do really speak to them, right? Like, it's tangible. You can, like, see it and get your hands mm-hmm. on it. And so when they see, like, tangibly, like, okay, my, like, um, cholesterol was this, and now it's this. Or, like, my blood sugar was this, and now it's this. And my blood pressure. It's like, okay, like, even if, like, the goal was just, like, maintenance and not really, like, body composition related, they're, like, my health, my energy, all of those things have improved. And, like, therefore, my quality of life has improved. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right, is improving. Oh, absolutely. I think especially at maintenance, this is super helpful because sometimes maintenance is so frustrating because you're like, oh, you know, we're just, the numbers are staying the same. Maybe you can't quite feel the difference in your clothes or like things like that yet. And so if you have those additional data, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's really, and we serve quite like like, um, a large range of population. Like my youngest client I've ever had was 16 and my oldest was... 72 so Mm -hmm. like all ages um so that's been really awesome to like kind of like see what what is important like what does that person value and what would like a success through coaching look like to that person and then talking to them about like okay at the end of this coaching relationship if you accomplish xyz you'd be happy okay so what does that look like for you that's awesome Mm -hmm. very cool i love that you're just 100 percent individualizing and um yeah thinking definitely anything but cookie cutter Mm -hmm. well yeah like i feel like people have seen too much cookie cutter like based on like like medicine (laughs) like as much as we try to individualize in medicine like unfortunately there's just not the time usually to allow for like those deep connections so oh exactly i can imagine often you have like 20 minutes with a client you still need to do the paperwork you need to do that and you see i don't know how many people a day so it can Mm -hmm. it can be very difficult Mm -hmm. i bet Mm -hmm. but no thanks so much for giving us a little bit of an insight into that and i am before we wrap up i have a more personal question to you that is because i know um that you married a german (laughs) (laughs) or at least somebody who moved um how old was nils when he moved from germany he was 14 he was 14 yeah 
Um, so, and we've been back multiple times, um, and that's been awesome for me to go in. Like, I met his Oma and saw his hometown, and we went to Oktoberfest, and, cool. and it's awesome to go, but yeah, my German. <laughs> Uh, no, I think that's uh, that's cool. I, I know that the joys and um, challenges of cross-cultural relationships, for sure. <laughs> but I'm super curious, like, when you have been over here, what did you think of, like, the German food or um, just generally, um, I guess, his German habits? Are there some that sometimes come through where you're like, oh, my God, you're so German? <laughs> um, when they call a salad anything covered in mayo, <laughs> it just kills me. I'm like, I remember like literally I went over to the, my mother and father-in-law's the other day and like they're still like speak very like dirt like if we're not around it's only German talk and like it's so funny like we went over the other day and I'm like oh like what like what can I bring for lunch and they're like we're good we got meat we got a salad I'm like okay like sweet sounds good I show up and it's like potato salad like I'm like this is so stereotypical yeah it's <laughs> like, salad or something. Oh, um, that's funny. yeah um Oh gosh, God, there's so much, and like it's so funny because like I just say to him sometimes, like, "Gosh, you're so German," and he's like, "I've been here for like 15 years," and I'm like, "Yeah, but it's still coming through." But just like his way of thinking, like there's a right and a wrong, and of course, like I live in this area of gray, and like he just dies because I'm like, "Well, what about this?" And like devil's advocating to him, and he's just like, "Right, wrong." Oh, uh, that's hilarious. Uh, because I mean, I I I often like to think of myself like hey okay i've also been living out of germany for about half of my life on and off mm -hmm. type of thing mm -hmm. and um you know i'm i don't consider myself like the classical german um but still there are a lot of traits that come through like specifically when it comes to punctuality when it comes oh, to yeah. accuracy and mm -hmm. no this has to be done that way why is it not done this way <laughs> yeah whenever i say the words good enough he's like no 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 it's not. Is it correct? Is it right? It's not good enough. It's not 80. It's like this. And I'm like, oh, goodness. Okay. Or like, it's so fun. He's such like a neat freak. And like, I'm like quite tidy. But like, if ever I want like our house clean, I'll just like make him mad. And all of a sudden the house will be like so clean because he like stress cleans. And <laughs> There you go. <laughs> go organize. I guess please. there's there's definitely worth worse habits or traits to yeah. have. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Oh, that's hilarious. But you guys are and have always been based in Alberta. As mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since oh. we've been together, we've been here. Yeah, uh, we've done lots of traveling, and we eventually plan when we're older to move to Italy. <laughs> um, oh. But as of right now, no, we're um, in um, Alberta. His uh, family they actually moved from Germany. Um, because his dad wanted to start a millwork company um, okay. and like a ca custom cabinetry company and just within Germany everything's already so well established it's really hard to start a business um, and so that's why they moved over here and so Niels now um, works with his dad at that uh, company in Lethbridge so awesome mm. well super cool and um, thanks for sharing a little bit of an insight into from an outside perspective into what, what Germans what's living with a with living with a German's like. <laughs> oh well they own a custom cabinetry shop and their their line is we're the best because we're German and everything's blown in from Germany as far as like machine goes and they all drive BMWs and I'm just like, oh you guys it's <laughs> the best way. <laughs> it's still very much there. Um, and so you took on his surname Rieger as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, cool. Very cool. Because I was like looking for you on Facebook and I was like, why is she not popping up? And then I, of course, obviously, because you got married. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got married in September, so almost a year. <laughs> oh, amazing. I hope it's been an awesome first year. Oh, it's been awesome. Yeah, we built a house last year and now we're living in it and life's, life's good. So, no very cool. here. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for your time. I'm happy I got to talk to you. And uh, generally, I think that there has been a lot of um, valuable information. Are there maybe one, two, three things that you would like to give people as like a takeaway, what to focus on or not stress about or so? Yeah, I would just say like, yeah, like, again, the biggest thing, like move your body like daily in a way that is accessible to you ideally we want some kind of strength training in there but even getting like that goal of like 8,000 to 10,000 steps is just like such a big thing for blood sugar for heart health for blood pressure all those things so if I could harp on people to do anything it'd be to eat a palm size of per serving of protein at each meal to eat a fist size of veggies at most meals and to get in eight to 10,000 steps a day 
because I truly think if you do those things, you're going to be better off than you were. So. Oh, absolutely. And uh, lifelong. I think those are things that are achievable lifelong for most people. Yeah, you can take with you traveling, you can do anywhere. And then another thing is obviously water. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are the big things. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful Friday and a good start to your weekend. Thanks. You as well, Lisa. Nice seeing you. Bye. Bye.